One week ago today, I had never used an iPad Pro, and yet here we are seven days later, and I've used very little other than the iPad for all of my day-to-day -day work. In fact, over the weekend, I never even touched a Mac. Everything I did was off of this tablet. Yep, there have been a few pinch points. There have been some workarounds I've had to learn, but nothing that stopped me getting everything done that I needed to off of this tablet. And later in the video, I'll be talking about what it's like with this nano texture display on the iPad, what it's like working from Mac or iPad, what the differences are. And also we'll be doing a, a real life stress test on the M4 chip that I've got in my iPad Pro when we try exporting some ProRes video footage from the iPad and use the same file to export for my M1 Max MacBook Pro. But that's all to come a little bit later on. Now I've got an iPad. I'm able to enter into a couple of conversations that I wasn't before, namely this clamor to bring Mac OS to iPad. I don't get it. Having used an iPad now, I don't get it. I don't want Mac OS on the iPad. If you've come from a Mac background or an iPhone background, it's fairly intuitive anyway. You get used to working on an iPad pretty quickly. And one fact that kind of stands, I think, and, and defends the, the, the reason not to bring Mac OS to iPad is the attach rate of Mac owners that also have iPads. It's over 50%, which shows that Mac owners know when it's the right time to pick up an iPad or when it's the right time to use a Mac. It kind of just naturally makes sense. Now, with the design of this particular iPad, of course, there was some concern that it was too thin, uh, just over five millimeters, that it was gonna bend. Well, again, real world test. I was in London last week for about eight or 10 hours with it in just an unpadded leather rucksack, and it was absolutely fine. There was no problems with it at all, so I think it's rigid enough. Again, in the real world, if you really want to bend it, I'm sure you could. One thing, one area that I think I've possibly shot myself in the foot is with the storage. I chose the one terabyte storage, and I think you can probably save yourself some money. Sure, I get the full unbin chip, so if something amazing comes out at WWDC next month, I'll be in a really good position to use it. But equally, that one terabyte storage is overkill. I've got every app on my iPad now that I want, including Photoshop, including Lightroom, and including Final Cut Pro. And I've only used 50 gigs of storage. And because we can now edit video, if you want to edit video in Final Cut on the iPad, you can work directly from an external SSD. You don't even need temporary flash storage to put it on the iPad. I'm never gonna touch anywhere near that one terabyte storage capacity that I've got. And that might be something that you want to think about before you buy yours. The design on the back with the cameras, it's odd. It's very un-Apple actually, because there's no unity. None of the lenses, none of those circles are the same size. It just looks a little bit messy. And the unfortunate thing is, that's the only part of the iPad that you can actually see when it's docked is the camera lenses sticking out. It just looks very weird. I'm not saying it's bad, just looks very weird. Let's talk about the keyboard first, because that almost makes this device. It's beautifully designed and from the outside looks much as the other Magic Keyboards. It's that rubberized material, which is great to touch, but I just wonder how well it's gonna fare because it seems to attract quite a lot of grease, fingerprints, scratches and scuffs. I guess only time will tell. It's beautifully designed for the iPad, as you'd imagine. It's got just a little lip around the edge that protects the iPad itself, and the magnets to keep it closed are really, really strong. There's no chance of the iPad suddenly opening up. Talking of magnets, I'd preferred if the Pencil Pro charged in the hinge as it was rumored we were gonna get. When I was in London last week, strong as the magnets are, I was just checking to make sure that the pencil hadn't fallen off at any given point in time. But the magnets are strong. Because I've got the 13 inch version of the Magic Keyboard, I've got a full set of keys, I think on the 11 inch version. Some of the keys are half size, but it is brilliant to type on. You want to work on it, it just is so inviting. It's comfortable, you've got that aluminum top now, the large glass trackpad with the haptic feedback. It feels as if you're working on a Mac, and certainly when I had it docked on my desk to a studio display, it was almost as if I was working on a desktop situation. It really is that good to use. It's a backlit keyboard and you can adjust the brightness of that backlighting as well. If you go into settings, general, keyboards, hardware keyboards, you'll find a slider in there. But the better way to go about it is to go into general and then go into control center. And in there you can find the add more, you can add the widget for the keyboard backlighting to your control center. So you just need to drag down from the top in the future, top right, and you can adjust the brightness of your keyboard there. And if you go into completely dark room, it will go to 100% brightness. Why you would work in a completely dark room, I do not know. I'm just giving you the facts. Uh, but it is a beautiful keyboard to use, which brings me to the first problem that I had with it, which is some apps don't work with the keyboard as it stands. That's a known problem apparently between iPad OS and keyboards, even first party keyboards like the one I've got here. I write all the time. I use Ulysses to write in and I use Grammarly to assist me in that. But no matter what, I could not get Grammarly to see my, my work. So I uninstalled the app, reinstalled the app, made sure it was the right app for iPad OS. 
everything was fine. I switched it on, switched it off. I just could not get it to work. Turns out it's a known glitch. And what you have to do is remove the tablet from the Magic Keyboard. You then initiate Grammarly with the glow button in the bottom left of your keyboard. You can reattach it then. It will then check your work, but it won't check it automatically. You have to check manually. So it is a bit of a pain. And that is one of the pinch points that I've mentioned. But at least there is a workaround. And also the Thunderbolt port on the, or the USB-C port on the Magic Keyboard does charge up to 60 hertz. So it's pretty rapid charging as well. But overall, the keyboard is just a marvelous experience to use just without one glitch. Last week, by the way, on the cameras, I showed what it was like to record using the front-facing selfie camera. This is what it looks like in 4K, 24p, using the main camera on the back. If you watched last week's video, you would have seen that I gave you a, a sample of what it was like recording with the front facing camera. Now I'm using the main 12 megapixel camera on the back, recording in 4K24, a little bit further away from the iPad than I would normally be. So I'd be interested to hear what the mic sound like. Obviously I am in my studio, so it's reasonably well sound treated, but this will give you an idea of what the color quality is like and also what the studio mics are like on this iPad Pro. Let's get into multitasking then, shall we? I'm gonna start with the pencil. I wish the pencil was more usable. I haven't used any of the new features on the pencil. That's not surprising. I didn't think I would when I bought it, but I'm getting into the habit of using apps in full screen. And I'm trying not to touch the display too much. I don't like smudgy displays, who does? And I just wish the pencil you could use to drag apps to full screen, but you can't, you have to either use the cursor or your finger. It's the same if you wanna go back to the homepage, you have to use your finger to swipe up. It'd be great if we could just use the pencil that little bit more. Now. I'd heard, this is another one of the conversations I can now get into about multitasking on an iPad. And for me, it seems to work just fine. I tried using Stage Manager on a Mac, made no sense at all, but Stage Manager on an iPad makes great sense. I can see all of the apps I've got open down the side of the screen. I can get to them quickly and begin working. Also, I love split screen as well, where you can have two apps open on the same screen. For instance, when I'm replying to all of the comments on videos, I have YouTube Studio open on one side, emails on the other side. I can cross-reference to check that I've answered everybody. It's a great workaround. And again, I mentioned when I hooked it up to the studio display, then I can right say on the iPad, I've got two screens if I'm referencing something on Safari or Chrome. I've got those open on the top screen. It's just a really, really great environment. Now, one of the things I had to teach myself, and again, if you're coming to iPad for the first time, this might interest you, was Screenshots, I use a receipt bank for work and I'm used to dragging screenshots or invoices into the, I use Dext and just saving them that way. Obviously on the iPad, it's different. I had to take a screenshot, which goes into files. I finally got used for the files app. And then from files, you can simply drag that into the receipt bank. That files app actually becomes really important uh, and it makes a great deal of sense on the iPad. And I kind of, of get it now. So for me, multitasking, I can't think of how I'm going to need to multitask any more than that. It works for me. I've been surprised how quickly I've adapted to iPad life over this past week. I miss the Mac on occasions, and there's some things I still have to do on a Mac. If I'm editing audio, for instance, that will always happen on a Mac. And some things are just more comfortable and easy to do on a Mac. But by and large, working on an iPad, an iPad OS, and this iPad Pro has been a real, real joy. Just wanted to say thank you for all the subs last week. We are pushing on towards, well, hopefully 10,000 subs by the end of the summer, and I need your help for that. Obviously, channels like this are not cheap to run, as you can imagine. This iPad cost me a tidy fortune last week, but I want to bring you great content about it, and I want to involve you guys in these videos as well. So thank you for all the comments. You know I get back to all of you. If you're new to this channel, and surprisingly, it's about 90% of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed. So if you're enjoying this content, that sub really does make a difference. If you're enjoying it that much, you want to leave me a super thanks, even better. But don't forget, like and turn on notifications as well, because I'm quite busy on the community. I post during the week as well. And more than anything, I just want you guys to be the first to know when I've posted a new video up. Right, let's talk display, shall we? Now, as you know, I ordered mine with the nano texture display on, and I'm not sure if I've made a mistake. Let me say right off the bat, until you get yourself in front of one of these iPads with the tandem OLED on, you have got no idea just how good these displays are. At the weekend, I was watching some YouTube, I was watching some Formula One, and I chose to watch it on this 13-inch iPad Pro rather than my 55-inch LED TV on the wall. It is that good. It is so punchy, so bright, and so vibrant. Now, I work indoors all of the time. So do I really need that nano texture? I'm not so sure. It does its job. It's perfectly flat, there are no reflections, and there's no glare. And I'd imagine, for longer periods of time, it's probably more comfortable to work on this than it would be an iPad without the nano texture. But it does take away just a little bit of the contrast and maybe a fraction, a fraction of the sharpness as well. 
Now, I took my iPad up to London last week, as you know, I went into the Apple store on Brompton Road, and I put mine down by the side of one that didn't have the nano texture on, and I was convinced that it looked almost as good, almost as good. But once I've been working on this week and writing in particular, looking at black text, it doesn't look quite as sharp, I say, as if I look on my iPhone 15 Pro Max, which is OLED, or even on the studio display, which isn't. There is definitely a tiny lack of sharpness to it, and I wonder if that's going to really begin to nag away at me over time. And also, you get reminded of what it'd be like without all the time you're looking at the display, because the nano texture doesn't go quite to the edge. The bezels are untreated. So you see how bright and reflective that glass is, and I just wonder if I should maybe swap it out. I've still got about a week left of my grace period where I could change it, and I'm wondering if I should do that. At the moment, I'm really torn. I think I need to go back and have another, another look and compare them and be really honest with myself long term. And if I did swap out, I'd also reduce the storage. I'd go for the 512. There is no need for me to have this terabyte storage, I say, particularly as you can edit directly from an external SSD. So if I took the nano texture off and went to 512 gigs of storage, I'd save myself 500 pounds. Something that I need to think about, and I will do a lot over the next few days. At the very beginning of the video, I mentioned I was going to do a real world stress test on this M4 chip to see how good it is. Now, not being a gamer, the only way I can stress it is with video export. In time, I'm going to produce a whole video for you using only iPad, Final Cut for iPad 2 and iPhone 15 Pro Max. But I'm just waiting for that new app to come out, the Final Cut camera app to come out. Once that's out, I've been invited on a training course with Apple in London. They're getting some creators together to teach us how to use it. Then I'll make a whole video. But for now, for now, I just kept a bit of footage that I shot for last week's video on the 15 Pro Max in ProRes Log. It's on the external SSD. There's no effects, there's no text. It's just a straight export, uh, like for like. And as you can see, the M4 iPad Pro exported it 16 seconds quicker than my M1 Max MacBook Pro. Now, also, I'm not trying to say that this iPad is good value for money, but it is about £2,000 cheaper than my M1 Max MacBook Pro. So I think this M4 chip is as special as they said. They also mentioned there were some new color correction tools being launched in Final Cut for iPad 2. And when I put that log footage in, the immediate way it was colored up using this new PQ to HLG conversion was stunning. I honestly don't think I'd have to do any correction to it. And of course, editing on this iPad, the colors look fantastic anyway. And I'm tempted to begin editing more on here just to see what the final export and color is going to be like. Like I mentioned, it is the best display that I've got. One word of warning to you though, if you are rendering or exporting a video on your iPad, don't try and do anything else. It will crash and you'll have to start again. I mean, okay, it seems you're not going to waste an awful lot of time, but you will have to start again. I'm guessing it's due to a limited GPU resources on the iPad, but this M4 chip, does look pretty, pretty special. My final thoughts on using the iPad after this first week, I'm really loving it. I thought coming from a Mac background, I might struggle, but you know what? I'm loving the working environment. When it's hooked up to the studio display at home, it's as if I'm working on a desktop. You can see how quick it is. It struggles for nothing. You can do anything you want on this iPad, and I'm really enjoying how comfortable it is to work on. Yes, I've got that one issue with Grammarly, but other than that, it's been a really, really enjoyable first week. Is it overpowered? Probably, but we've seen how good that M4 chip is. The fact it could export that video file that much quicker on an iPad shows you how good that chip is. Of course, at the moment, I've got the fully unbin chip in here. What's coming at WWDC, we don't know. But this M4 chip in the iPad Pro makes this iPad now a really solid working experience. Get yourself down to store, try the keyboard, look at that display. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. I have really enjoyed working on it over this week. I'm going to force myself to work on it more and more. If it's the first video you've watched or if you enjoyed this video, don't forget subscribing really does help me out as a channel. It just helps us to grow. I'll be back next week with another video, I dare say, about living the iPad life. But until then, thank you ever so much for watching and I'll see you soon.